Maryland and resident of Louisville, spent time hunting in the rolling woodlands of Du Bois County. With money left to him by his wealthy father, Geiger purchased nearly 2,000 acres of land where he founded a community. Because game was plentiful and the area was his hunting haven, Geiger called the community Huntingburg. The earliest pioneers in Geiger's community were soon joined by German immigrants, seeking a better life in frontier America. Initially, there was friction between the new Germans and the Americans, as they were called, but that was soon overcome, as the honesty, fearlessness, craftsmanship, and hard work of the Germans was recognized. Their early commerce included trading in coonskins and whiskey, later evolving into stores, blacksmith shops, courthouses, tanneries, and mills. By 1850, Huntingburg was a village of 214 persons. A number of Huntingburg's young men enthusiastically responded to an 1861 call for volunteers for the Union Army. But by 1864, many were weary of the war and fervently supported peace efforts. In 1882, veterans formed a post of the Grand Army of the Republic. By 1924, with only six surviving members, the post surrendered its charter to the Huntingburg Public Library. By the turn of the century, Huntingburg was a thriving place, one of the most flourishing towns in inland Indiana. Tobacco was Huntingburg's first great industry, but the manufacture of bricks, wagons, woolens, and wood furniture were also booming. All this activity created a need for retailing, and 4th Street was alive with shops, people, and activity. The coming of the railroad not only brought more growth and prosperity to Huntingburg, but it diversified the ethnic background of the area by bringing people of English and Irish descent to mix with the strong German population. Huntingburg's population swelled to over 3,000 people, and the town's new newspapers heralded the progress. Huntingburg's residents no longer lived in a vacuum. I've been around here a long time. Um, I'm 92 years old, and I was born in Texas and came here when I was four years old. I was born in, in 1895 and been living, uh, I had lived on this corner ever since I was in 1900, I'll say. I'd say I was six or seven years old when, when uh, we got, uh, you know, when the, when the first electric lights came on. Up to that time, we'd had an old lamp light, we'd had a lamp lighter go around to different corners. I guess there was at least 15 kids, all of us waiting for that, and they were a little late getting here. We was getting a little bit worried that they wasn't going to get on that, wasn't going to come on that night. And we laid up on that bank. We laid down and waited for the lights to come on. And uh, well, of course, when they came on, uh, I don't think they stayed on. I think they flickered out and came on then again. And we all cheered and we, we thought that, that was, that was nice. That was pretty nice. With the advent of the automobile, railroads impact diminished. Fire ended the tobacco era and the woolen mills, wagon works, and pottery works gradually died out. Though new business and industry cropped up to replace it, and furniture factories and agriculture continued to thrive, Huntingburg would never again note the boomtown atmosphere it had known in the early part of the 20th century. Yet, progress continued, and the town continued a pattern of growth and modernization on a number of fronts. And Huntingburg continues to have a reputation as a city that is a wonderful place to live, to grow, to do business, and to raise a family. The most important thing about Huntingburg would be the people. They're just uh, really special here. It's a warm, friendly environment, and it's also a healthy environment where uh, you, you feel secure about your kids being out without worrying about them.
and uh, you can walk down the street and people are warm and friendly and smile and, and mo most of the time you know them. If, if not, you, you might wonder who's new in town. <laughs> Today, Huntingburg is a modern, friendly community. Its population is still around 5,300 people. And while proud of its roots and its heritage, residents keep an eye on the future and progress is clearly visible. Schools, churches, business and industry activities, natural beauty, and above all, its people make the quality of life in Huntingburg, Indiana, a shining example of the heartland experience. I don't really know where you'd find any better place to live than here in Huntingburg. And it's just been a great place to raise our children. We really feel like it's been a, a really great environment for them. From Colonel Geiger's hunting ground, to a turn of the century boomtown, to a thriving modern community, Huntingburg is proud of what it has been, what it is, and what it will be. And today in 1987, Huntingburg proudly celebrates its sesquicentennial with 10 days of community activities. I'm Irene Marie Fisher Frakes. My father, Archibald Charles Fisher, was born in the Fisher Geiger home on Geiger Street here in Huntingburg. And all my life, I've heard all the history since he was a young child. His uh, grandfather was Colonel Geiger. It was probably his great grandfather. Colonel Geiger was uh, from the Black Forest of Germany. He was very wealthy, and he came to settle in Louisville in the United States. And he and many uh, of his friends came to this area to hunt. It was a wooded area, and he loved it so. And my father, this is probably magnified. Now my, my father told me he owned, at one time he owned all of Du Bois County, Colonel Geiger, Jacob Geiger. But he, he, he did contribute to the uh, city hall, I believe, the city hall to Huntingburg. And he built the home on Geiger Street. And it's, I, I went by a while ago and took a picture, and it's magnificent. I, so I'm happy to be here, and, and I'm very proud that my heritage comes from Huntingburg.
temper. Even now, still live from distant places and are here now to share with us in this celebration. To all of you, I would like to extend the name of fellow citizens and bid you welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, the singing of the Star Spangled Banner by Mrs. Imelda Whitten. Columbus, accidentally discovering America, found here a race of man he called Indians, thinking he was in the Indies. From where that region lived intelligent Miami Indians called Piancasaw, meaning those who have scattered. There are legends of the habits and customs of the American Indians, but they would make a story all of its own. Suffice it to say that there were good hunters along Indian Creek who brought the meat while the squaw provided the cornbread. The Indian girls ground the corn into meal while the sturdy young braves practiced shooting. The old men, who were no longer able to go hunting, would make themselves useful by preparing the arrowheads and tomahawks for the brave warriors and gallant hunters. The young girls, although the most useful of the tribe, did not fare as well and were not looked upon as favorable as their brothers. They did most of their work, and whenever the tribe moved, the burden of transporting the most essential things fell on their backs. Frederick Geiger, who had previously encountered Indian opposition. Can you visualize what Colonel Geiger and his friends saw when they came to this area in the year 1834 or 1836? The rolling hills, the green valleys, the tall virgin timber overhead, trees of many kinds, such as maple, oak, old homes, and old furniture, and in tools which were made from these different woods. Colonel Geiger was so impressed with these forests and hills that he decided to make them his permanent home. He returned to Lowell, and in 1837, he purchased large tracts of land from the government near the present city of Huntingburg in Dubois County. His total purchase of approximately 1,920 acres, all in one unbroken track, measuring eight and a half miles around, was the largest such purchase made in that day. Eager to move to his newly acquired land, he proceeded with his dream. He sent his eldest daughter, Mary, and her husband, Captain John T. Doan, ahead to make a home in this new land. The village of Huntingburg was established in 1837 with Colonel Geiger making his own home in the vicinity in 1840. He brought with him his wife and daughter, Henrietta, and her husband, Colonel William G. Helfrich. Legend also has it that pigeons came in such numbers that they darkened the sky and roosted in the trees. The men would hunt at night with torches to wage war on them and sell them at 25 cents per bushel. This is probably how the Northwest Knoll received the name Pigeon Roost.
time went on, other settlers came and brought their families. Among them was Mr. Fallon, a carpenter and builder whose large family was eventually scattered to various parts of the country. If the colonel saw a boy loafing away his time, he would call out to him, Your mother wants you. Even though the boys feared him, he was really a friend and did many kind things. Sandy Kessler is wearing a dress from the year 1910, which was worn by her grandmother, Matilda Bartle. If you could just see it, it's, it's uh, beautiful lace on the bottom. And I am wearing my grandmother's, uh, Grandmother Afterhar's wedding skirt from the year 1910. The blouse has been lost through the years, and the veil was laced from the head all the way to the floor. Most of the clothes that I'm wearing tonight are um, authentic from the years 1890 to 1910. In 1843, the third church of the community was established, the Emmanuel Evangelical Church, located west of town on what is known as Maple Grove Campground. Six years later a second evangelical church was built and 55 years later in 1904 the two con congregations outgrew their buildings and united congregations to build a church at fourth and geiger streets they continued meeting there until 1968 when that congregation united with the Huntingburg united methodist church the fourth church was organized in 1847 and was known as the German Methodist Church. Today we know it as the United Methodist Church. The first building was located at Fifth and Geiger, and in 1864 a church was built at its present site. Let's spend a few moments in an early church service. You'll notice that the settlers bringing grain and produce as they came to, the wor to worship. They did this because it would eliminate their making another trip to town to do the marketing. It was a custom also at the service that men would sit on one side while the ladies would be seated on the other side of the church. Let's take a look and see what's happening. Let's listen now as a board of trustees meeting is called to order. Fatberg. Board of Trustees of the City of Huntingburg will now come to order. If it's okay with you men, we'll dispense with the reading of the minutes. We have some important matters to discuss. If you'll find them on the agenda that you've been given out today. Now, the next article, section 14, if any peddler has two horses or mules, doesn't matter, and a carriage or other vehicle, and shall sell merchandise within the city limits, I think they ought to be required to pay $2 a day. Well, we don't worry about those trivial matters. We've got to take care of this, because those hogs may be beautiful, but we can't let them go rooting and stooting all over town, plucking and pulling up those pretty petunia plants. we got to stop those pirating pigs from pulverizing our petunia patches. Isn't that right? Well, fuck her out on that one. This little lady was Lizzie Snear, who resided at Fifth and Main Streets. She was a Watkins representative in Huntingburg for many years, earning a livelihood. Thank you, Lizzie. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Thank 
you, Popcorn Charlie. Miss Jen, Miss Genevieve Williams, known as Miss Jen, could be seen on our streets making her daily trips to and from the library. Walking most erect, she was always equipped with her satchel. In her other hand was a black umbrella, prepared for the weather, whether it be rain or shine. It was his duty to advise motorists of an approaching train. This was done by means of a round stop sign which he could hold up at the crossing and vehicles would stop. When the train had cleared the crossing, he would retire to his tiny shelter only to wait for the next train. This was printed in German until 1913 for the benefit of the Germans who could not read the English newspapers. It was operated by the Pickhart family until 1933 when the paper was purchased by the Argus newspaper. Its last recorded issue was June the 25th, 1963. The sound of this horn called the youngsters to leave their play and follow him for an expected treat. Sure enough, when they arrived at a neighborhood store, each child was given a treat. <laughs> Huntingburg's last neighborhood grocery, the North Side, closed its doors last year. You could always see the Crowder gang there, sipping on a cherry Coke and dancing to the latest hit tunes on the jukebox in the rear of the palace. The palace was noted for a wide, for, far and wide for the famous Palace Hamburger. We have World War II Army, portrayed by Howard Hoss. The World War II nurse, wearing the authentic uniforms. The Army... And the Navy. For one soldiers who served their country in the war to end all wars. Waldo Ellsworth, Homer Grant, Ray Link, Norrell Phillips, and Silas Ebohair. We're indeed happy to... after a similar bow type structure in Heron, Illinois, with no interior vertical supports to mar a spectator's view. Many talented athletes have given their all and many interesting events have taken place throughout the years. The boys team was given the name of the Lions by Coach Harry Apostle in 1924. This team beat Jasper that year and for the first time in history, they won the county tourney and the sectional. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the 1936-37 Happy Hunters basketball team. Mr. Hanger Monday. Mr. Wilford Spatz Miller. Mr. Lionel Brown. Mr. Ray Richardson. And Mr. Bob Minky. Other members of that team were Don Blimker, Charles Landgravy, Norman Hassler, Richard Ellsworth, and Elmer Hunnibut, and... Let's teach these freaks some manners! Good luck out there, Captain! But I don't need luck, I have skill. I don't have my keys. As long as people misplace their keys, you can count on Geico saving folks... Okay. 
seems awful tight to me to be playing basketball. <laughs> All right. Now, now we have a surprise for you, Lady Bearcats. boys run up to the next car here quickly take the break off. What's the matter with we end the program I we are going to have um, a, a, a little um, thank you for Janice and Mabel afterwards but I personally want to say thank you to Janice Castrop and Mabel Bartle who rewrote this play and got it all together themselves and I think that each of us who were here this evening when you see them thank them I thank you very much ladies We've been doing a lot of reminiscing about Huntingburg's past history and accomplishments, but let's not stop here. Our city continues to grow. There are new housing developments which are filled almost upon completion. 
Our industries are expanding, individual businesses keep modernizing, and new ones open their doors. Farmers' supplies are readily available through expanding companies. While the access to the Southern Railroad, good highways... Welcome to Trading Nation. I'm Michelle Caruso Cabrera. The Dow surging... Recreational needs are met through the park and recreation department with a new swimming pool and surrounding park areas. Health needs are met through the St. Joseph's Hospital, which constantly seeks ways to serve the community better. There are many good doctors, dentists, optometrists, and clinics whose goals are to provide the very best in health care. It is a long way from the first one-room schoolhouse to our present modern educational facilities. Cross court to Yoakum, Yoakum from A, too short. Rebound, Phil Wall has it. Patriots back the other way, Southridge in a man-to-man -man as it is. Steinhardt on Wall. Wall down the middle, knives through, lays it off the glass, partially blocked, picked off, and thrown out of bounds by... Picked it up, but he threw it out of bounds. Raiders against...
drag and drop. stop and think a minute about this group of people behind me. They've all worked very hard for about 18 to 19 months. Uh, they've all put a lot of work in it. I could individually tell you what they've all done, but that'd take all night. Uh, I personally want to take the time now to thank just two or three people that have, have helped me a great deal as uh, chairman of the Sussman Centennial Committee. Of course, my wife and family have had to put up with a lot of um, hardships and, and time with me away from home, so I appreciate uh, all that they've done. And uh, along with uh, Chad Songer, what he's done in writing the history of Huntingburg, which is very important to all of us, I'd like to take his time to thank Paul Mundy and Herb Treader, who have personally been my left and right hand in, uh, in regards to all the things I've been involved in. Uh, I had to make an awful lot of decisions, supposedly on my own as chairman, but uh, the three of us uh, talked most of the things out whenever we had a problem or situation. So it was not always uh, General Chairman's decision. These two gentlemen need an awful lot of uh, applause and respect for what they've done and contributed to this effort. We are preparing ourselves to look at our past, our present, and our future. At that point, I would like to ask that Chad Songer do some of the history here in the short moments and to give our closing ceremonies and then turn it over to Hard Menden Hall for our capsule closing. So at this point, let's give a big thank you to Judge Chad Songer for writing our history and for participating with us. Chad. I thought he was gonna give me that money he had in his hand. A hundred uh, rather, 50 years ago, the Reverend C.W. Parks was main speaker at the memorial conducted at Jacob Geiger's gravesite, and he said these words, We stand here today between two vast eternities. Behind us is the unlimited past. Before us is the unbounded future. We are the children of the past. We are the products of all that has gone on before. We are the progenitors of the future, the molders of all that is to come. We are the clay of the past, the potters of the future. And these children down here, all six years old, will be 56 
at 2037, and they will be planning, organizing, and running the bicentennial in 2037. And I can tell that with the city in the hands of youngsters as vigorous and as bright as these are, that it has a future and that it will reach its bicentennial in 2037. Thank you. This time I'll turn it over to Howard Mendenhall for the sealing of the time capsule. Howard. Thank you, Judge Sager. I want to congratulate everybody who has come here from the Crestview School, first graders. You are our future. Now, when you come back here, you've got a job some 50 years from now. You are going to be entrusted with the opening of the time capsule, which we have prepared, showing what our city was like in the year 1987. Now, I have a plaque here, which is going to be fastened to the capsule. The capsule is not a, room, a thing like a, um, well, it's hard to visualize a capsule, but what we have decided to do is to take a heavy, steel safe and put this plaque on the safe and we will put that safe in a safe place until the year 2037 and it will be up to you first graders or now second graders to give the mayor of Huntingburg the combination to that safe now I want to read from the plaque that it will be on the outside of our time capsule. And it says, time capsule, the con contents, memorabilia from 18, uh, 1987, sesquicentennial, to be opened by the mayor of Huntingburg in the year 2037, as per written instructions to be presented by members of the first grade class of 1987 Crestview School. And it will be sealed by Dale W. Helmrich, Mayor, and Hugo Sanger, our judge from the circuit court. If this time capsule can no longer be kept at City Hall, please place it in a custody of the Huntingburg Public Library. Now, I'm going to read a copy of the letter that each one of you will receive in a sealed envelope. And I want each one of you to keep that sealed envelope for 50 years. Now that's a long time. I don't want you to lose that sealed envelope because you are to give that envelope to the mayor of Huntingburg in the, gen in the month of January in the year 2037. So you have a very important job to do. And this letter, uh, so that you will know what it is in it without opening the letter. I'm going to read it out loud so that you will know what's in that letter. So listen up real well to what's in that letter that you're going to receive. It says, Dear Mayor of Huntingburg, in 2037, the presenter of this letter was a student in the first grade of Huntingburg Crestview School at the time of our sesquicentennial centennial in 1987. As requested, it is being presented to you so that it may help you to locate and open the time capsule we have prepared for you, which is filled with mementos of our city as it was in 1987. We made an attempt to include the names of all the persons living here, information about our churches, schools, merchants, and businesses, large and small. We sincerely hope that you will find it interesting and useful. Our capsule contains, is contained in a 26 by 30 Mossler steel safe on casters, now located in the front room of our present city hall at 511 4th Street. Should it be that that building no longer exists, then we have a new city hall and they can't accommodate it. On the outside of the safe, there is a plaque which instructs that it be removed to the custody of the city librarian. And the, then the combination of that safe is listed, and you are the only ones that will have that combination besides the mayor. So it's up to you to give the mayor, and because I don't think Mayor Elmrich is going to be here for the next celebration. 
So it's up to you to give him the combination of that safe. And the letter goes on to say, I hope that you will welcome the presenter to share the viewing of the material enclosed in our capsule and to participate in any ceremonies attending its opening. And signed by Dale Helmrich, mayor of the city of Huntingburg, dated the 12th of July, 1987. The mayor is going to give each one of you a copy of this letter, a sealed copy for you to give to the new mayor in the year 2037. Okay, young people, as he said, the first graders, and we'll be asking you to come up. I want you to give your name. And I'm asked Queen Tanya Miller to help me to give you the letter, Paul. <clears throat> You're going to have to help assist us. We need some help down there so we can line them up. They can go off and come one at a time here so that they would know. And also, I want to say thank you, committee, for all your efforts, work, for serving. Roger, thank you. I mean it. I, I sincerely say that we've had a celebration bar none. We've really celebrated and we've had a good time. And it's been worth it, I think, now. I'll say that tomorrow probably a little better. But it's been fun. And I want to say thank you for that. Okay, Paul? Let's give this committee a hand, people. This is one that's done your job for you. Okay, what is your name? Tara. Tara what? Um, Eric and Ubalor. Eric Ubalor. Eric and Erica and Ubalor. Okay. Come right over here. Erica and Ubalor. What's yours? Andrea Lynn Haller. A Andrea Lynn Haller. Okay, thank you. Allison. Give give your full names when you come up here, okay? Your entire name. Allison Michelle Holler. Allison Holler, okay. Rachel Mila Fritz. Rachel? Okay, thank you. Amanda Marie Ripstra. Amanda Ripstra, thank you. Carla 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 Kratzer. Kratzer. Carla? Okay. Crystal Fleck. Crystal Fleck. Jennifer Berkey. Jennifer Berkey. Whitney Nykum. What is your name? Whitney Nykum. Whitney Nykum. Zach Hissel. Let's think hard for getting the time capsule ready. All of his ideas and his work and everything, and he's going to seal it now. What's the card, please? Any first grader who has not received one of these, I will have them in the office and they will get theirs. So be sure and tell them, okay? It's sealed. <laughs>